Good evening and welcome to tonight's STEM Cafe, Into the Nano World, Enabling Technologies of the Future. I'm Dr. Judy Diamond, your host uh, for this evening and the organizer of the STEM Cafes for the last eight years. Our STEM Cafes are brought to you by NIU STEAM and the Center for P20 Engagement at Northern Illinois University. Thanks to the generosity of our patrons, we are able to offer this STEM Cafe free of charge. Please consider making a donation so we can continue to provide engaging programs like this one. We want our STEM Cafes to be available to everyone so we are not charging for registration. Any donation is appreciated, large or small. You can uh, go to this link if you're interested go.niu.edu forward slash give, and this is all caps, NIU STEAM. NIU STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, uh, the Arts, and Math. STEM cafes are fun, casual gatherings where art, uh, adults can eat, drink, and uh, share uh, discussion with uh, uh, STEM experts. Uh, either on hot topics or the latest research. We usually hold them in restaurants, but this evening we're going to be virtual, as you can see, and you're going to have to provide your own snacks and favorite beverages. But I did talk to Fatty's uh, Pub and Grill yesterday. Uh, as you know, that's one of the places that we frequently uh, hold our STEM cafes when we are in person, and they are going to continue to offer 10% discount to anyone who orders, uh, who mentions that they have attended this STEM cafe. For those of you that have not attended our STEM cafes before, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how uh, the evening will look tonight. Uh, our speaker will speak for approximately an hour and during the talk and uh, at the break right afterwards, you can write in uh, your questions uh, and, or comments and uh, we will not answer those uh, questions until the right after the talk. If you have uh, some questions or some concerns during the actual presentation, you can use a chat box to communicate directly to me, but any questions for the speaker need to go into the Q&A box. So we will be, not be answering the questions uh, for uh, the professor in the chat box, but instead in the Q&A box. Uh, if you are having any difficulty hearing, there is a way that you can control your own uh, screen and sound. If you go to the very bottom of your screen at the left hand side, you will see a button that ha says mute. If you click on that button, there is a um, a menu that comes up and if you go to the very bottom it will say audio settings and you can control your own audio settings so that it is loud enough or softer since I talk pretty loudly um, so you can control your own so let's get going tonight's cafe then is nano world exploring technologies of the future Nanotechnology is changing the face of science and engineering as we study the manipulation of matter at the level of the individual atom or molecule. With advances in nanotechnology, sci-fi concepts are closer to reality than ever. Tonight you will learn the what, the why, and how of nanotechnology. Dr. Korampali will discuss the latest methods of creating nanoparticles and nanostructures and provide examples of existing nanotech applications. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Vinu Korampali, is an NIU Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering. He received his PhD and his master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Missouri. His research interests have been the development of novel new techniques of fabrication using nanoparticles 100,000 times smaller than the tip of a human hair as the essential building blocks. 
The application of the materials and processes he has developed over the years are many, including but not limited to biosensing and environmental sensing, medical imaging and coatings. He actually has four patents and numerous publications. So with that, I'm going to welcome Dr. Coram Pali. Would you like to begin? Absolutely. Thank you, Judith. Let me start by sharing my slides here. And uh, yeah. So you should be able to see the slides now. We can see them. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let me get started by thanking you again, Judith, for the introduction and giving me this opportunity to present today. And I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, presentation. Again, uh, the way I have prepared this presentation is so that uh, even if you don't have much understanding in the technological field, I hope you'll be able to get something out of it. Okay, so I basically prepared it at a very basic level and I hope you'll be able to follow through with me during the presentation. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, again, I would like to, to make a disclaimer that uh, nanotechnology again, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field it's an ocean uh, in a way, it's affecting every possible field that you can think of. Um, and what I've really touched in this presentation is basically a tip of the iceberg, if you, if you wanna think in that terms. So here's my agenda today. So again, as Judith mentioned, we're gonna talk about what, why, and how of this technology. So what really is nano? Let's start with that, uh, a fundamental introduction to this. And, uh, and then why, why nano? It's not like we have a choice really uh, in, in the technological field. You know, nano is the next logical progression as you will see in this talk today. And then uh, the other question that I would like to answer or at least give a brief introduction to is how, how can we actually make nano in the first place? And how can we actually apply them in, 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 in applications that we can experience in everyday life? And then finally, I would uh, conclude this presentation. All right, so let's start with this, uh, this picture. And, uh, and some of you might have seen it before. So what you have here is actually a, the, one of the first computers uh, some in, in, the late, in the 1940s, in the late 1940s, okay? And as you can see here, this, this computer would actually occupy the entire room. And uh, so this, to be more specific, this, was, this would be the ED SAC computer that was uh, housed in Cambridge University in 1949. And within 60 years, you have what you, what you call the iPhone, iPhone 3, the Apple iPhone 3, that you can actually hold in your hands and which is much more powerful than what you see uh, on, your, uh, on your left, right? So, so what led to this present, this technological revolution in a, in, a, in a thought, right? Because in 60 years, 60 years is basically, uh, I would say uh, a flash in, in the technological evolution times, uh, times point. If you consider, to just to give you the perspective, uh, we had the invention of fire, uh, to have the man learned how to make fire sometime in the Neolithic period, that was you know, uh, 10,000 to 3000 BC. And then man learned to make a light bulb in 1878. So that's like thousands of years of uh, evolution led us to this kind of development. And you can think about the previous slide with 60 years is nothing compared to that. So what led to this? Right. So again, it's, it's all basically the magic of miniaturization. So how did this happen? Uh, the, the primitive computers that I, we just uh, saw before, these were made of these uh, large components. Okay. So these are the fundamental building blocks that made those computers were really large to start with. And of course, when, when you make, make using those large building blocks, you will end up with a computer that is large. Right. So as you can see here, these are, these are the vacuum diode uh, devices that were made, that were actually used to make those computers. And as you can see here, I don't know if I can, I can see the pointer. Let me see if I can. Yeah. As you can see here, these are made of glass. And of course, uh, even some of the consumer uh, applications still feature some of these uh, vacuum diodes, especially in your music systems uh, or the old music systems amplifiers. So what you have is this glass uh, vacuum device. And as you can see, these are more, uh, these are delicate. You can actually break them. These are large. These are made of multiple parts coming together. So you can have multiple wires and uh, 
multiple parts coming together to make a single vacuum diode. Okay. Now, what really led to the revolution in terms of uh, miniature, mini miniaturization these, uh, of your computing devices is this. Of course, not the cheese. I would like to take the analogy of the cheese. So what you have here is a cheese, is a piece of cheese. Uh, if I cut this cheese into smaller pieces, it still remains as cheese, right? If I cut it into smaller pieces, the property, the intrinsic properties of cheese do not change. So what really happened between this time and what we have now is the invention of the technology of uh, integrated circuits and transistors, the planar transistor technology that relied on the intrinsic properties of materials. So the idea is if I can make a transistor out of this cheese, okay, that relies on the properties of cheese, then the smaller the cheese I can make, the smaller the transistor I can make. And by making this transistor small, I can fit more number of transistors on a single piece of circuit, okay? Now, if you, if you think about this, so of course we don't use cheese to make these transistors, we use semiconductors. So what you see here is a single crystalline silicon semiconductor and we use the intrinsic semiconducting properties. So basically you have a, typical, a property, a physical property of silicon that can be used to make a transistor, okay? So if I can make my technology so that the smaller, if I, if I can use the smaller piece of the silicon, the smaller the transistor becomes, and I can pack more transistors on the same chip, on the same wafer, we call them wafers in this case, okay? So here you have a four inch wafer, most likely, with, a non, with all of these squares. So each square, you can think about that as a microprocessor, which basically forms the, the brain of your computer. And of course, over the years, uh, ever since the invention of uh, integrated circuits and the transistor technology become relevant, uh, people have been making these transistors smaller and smaller. And that's why as with every new version of your iPhone or your Android phone, you have more functionality more. And, and of course you know, these, these systems are becoming more, uh, more powerful in, in terms of computation, right? You are able to, you, are, you have, you are, basically you are able to actually hold a, a computer in your palms and which is much more powerful than what you had even just 10 years back, like a desktop. Okay, so the idea is again, to, to summarize, we are able to make this transistor smaller and smaller, packing billions of these transistors on a single chip, on a single wafer. And as the size goes down, the price goes down. And because I'm able to integrate more transistors per chip, my functionality goes up. So it's a win-win situation in a way. So you make things smaller, uh, the price goes down, the functionality goes up, okay? And here's uh, uh, a magnified or zoomed in image of what really, uh, what, your, what really happens on the chip. So basically this is what you have. Uh, again, the idea is the smaller amount of silicon I can use to make my device, the more transistors I can fit on the same piece of silicon. So that's, the, that's, that's what led to the revolution. So, the, so over the last few decades, we have had many developments in terms of fabrication technologies that can make these devices smaller and smaller. And that's why you have these powerful computers in your hands right now. Okay. Now, and here's the technological roadmap over the years uh, of how the technology actually scaled down over the time. So these are the actually single transistors. These are the scanning electron microscope images. And as you can see, the technology actually went down. We were able to make these smaller and smaller. And we, we basically, quantitate them in terms of these nodes. So we started out with 2000, 2003, we had the 90 nanometer node technology, and then that goes, that, that went down progressively over the years. Now, of course, we cannot just make them shrink the sizes of these smaller and smaller. We obviously at some point, we have to hit the, hit the wall, right? And we are actually about there where we are, at, we are actually hitting the, hitting the wall in terms of technological evolution, because as you make things smaller than a particular size, you have what is called quantum mechanical effects taking, uh, uh, coming into picture, okay? So, so what really is nano? Again, let's take a step back and try to understand what nano is in the, in the first place. Again, when I say nano here, we are referring to the length scales in this case, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, okay? And uh, so just to give a perspective of what this, is what, what kind of length scales we are talking about. Uh, these are some things that are visible. You can actually see, right? So kidney beans, you know, that's about one centimeter long. 
And then if one tenth of that size is uh, dog flea, that's something that you can still see. And uh, one tenth of that is uh, the, the, the diameter of your uh, hair, uh, typical human hair, about 100 microns wide, okay? And now if you go down further, again, we are coming into the invisible world, right? So again, uh, bacteria, again, that's something that you have on your body, within, inside you, everywhere. That's about, uh, that's about, um, I would say 500 nanometers across. Okay, so of course this is rod shaped, the diameter of that about 500 nanometers. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, that's, uh, that's devastating the economies and everybody around the world, that's about 75 nanometers wide. This is something that you cannot see. The bacteria, the, the viruses, these are something that you cannot see. They are, they are invisible. You have to have a powerful microscope, like an electron microscope or special microscopes to be, able, to be able to actually see them. And then smaller than that, of course, is the atom. The atom is about one-tenth the size of uh, one-tenth the nanometer, okay? One-tenth of a nanometer. So when we talk about nanotechnology, we are really focusing in this size regime between, 70, between 100 nanometers and all the way to, down to one nanometer, okay? Now, so why do we want to go there in the first place? So why nanotechnology? So this is a, the title of a talk that was given by Dr. Uh, Richard Feynman uh, in Caltech 1959. Again, that was time when there was no talk about nanotechnology. So he, his talk was about there is plenty of room at the bottom. So he was actually referring to this technological evolutions or evolution that can happen with nanotechnology. Okay, and, there, and as you will see here, there is indeed, there's plenty of room. There's a lot of uh, interesting applications of these technologic, technological implications. So why nanotechnology? Again, let's start with the cheese analogy. So you, again, we have the cheese. You cut them into small pieces, it remains cheese. The properties do not drastically change, right? It still has the taste and smell of cheese. And you cut them smaller. Let's say you, you know, uh, it's a grated cheese, much smaller than the cubes. It, the, the intrinsic properties of cheese still remain. They do not change, right? Now, what happens, of course, when you actually make them to nano cheese? When you make them so small that you cannot see them, of course, that's why I don't have anything here because you cannot see nano cheese. But what about the taste? If I have a number of these nanoparticles of cheese, can I still call them cheese? I don't know because nobody really made nano cheese. We don't know how it will taste. Uh, maybe they will. Maybe they will taste completely different uh, than nano cheese than 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 what you the, the cheese that you that you know of. So, so that nanotechnology actually presents new challenges because as you have just seen in terms of micro micro fabrication and fabrication of, the, of these transistors, we are at a stage where we'll be hitting the roadblock uh, in terms of how do we go smaller without actually uh, you know, having these multiple transistors communicating with each other in an undesirable way, right? So because of this quantum mechanical effects. So, so this presents some new challenges that we have to address and new opportunities uh, because as, you, as I will show you in the subsequent slides, this material properties as you shrink the size uh, to, to the nanoscale, complete, it changes completely different, okay? Uh, take the example of gold. We all know how gold looks. Uh, so it's basically nice and reflective. Uh, it's, that again, it's reflective because when light gets incident on the gold surface, uh, like a mirror, it basically reflects the light, right? So that's why it basically appears very reflective, okay? Now, what happens when I actually change the size of these particles? Well as long as they're in the millimeter scale and micron scale, they would still look like gold. There is not much difference between a, a millimeter sized gold particle versus a gold block. Okay. Now, if I keep continuing the process of making it smaller and smaller, what do I see? What I see is once it reaches a state, once it reaches a size, the properties of the gold are completely different. It's still the gold, it's, it's made of gold atoms, but the way the look and everything changes completely drastically, uh, instead of looking nice and reflective, it starts appearing to be red, actually wine red. I, if I continue you know, decreasing, decreasing the size, it still remains uh, red for a, for a moment, different shades of red, if you will. And, and what, uh, what I have here is actually actual gold particles, gold nanoparticles, different sizes. This is the bulk gold, still reflective, Micro scale and 100 nanometer gold particles and 20 nanometer gold particles, as you can see here. 
these are particles. Of course, you cannot see the individual particles, but what you see here is a macroscopic uh, uh, properties of this gold. Uh, so you have a bulk, bunch of these gold particles that are dispersed in water. And what you have is water, uh, basically water that are containing these particles here, well dispersed. Okay, if I continue doing this, after a certain size range, when you actually reach a size range where you have a gold particle containing few atoms of gold, which, which, which you can actually count, okay? Then the property is completely are uh, completely different than even the nanoparticles of gold. So now you're talking about gold particles that are that are luminescent. Okay, luminescent as in, for example, when you go to a uh, when you go to a, a dance floor, for example, uh, you have again uh, you must have experienced this. You have this uh, you know this uh, black light. And that illuminates your, if you're wearing a white t-shirt, basically that's, that, that glows in that black light, right? So similar to this, what you have in the black light is basically some UV light and absorbing that UV light, it basically fluoresces, it illuminates. illuminates okay? so, the, as, so the properties change drastically compared to what we have, what we have, what we are experienced with compared to their bulk properties. So what can we do with this? Are there any applications of this? So that's, uh, and why do the, why does that happen in the first place, right? So why this discrepancy between the bulk properties and the uh, and the nanoscale properties? So let's take a, a simple um, calculation here. Okay. So what really happens is let's take a sphere and look at the surface area to volume ratio. The surface area of a sphere, uh, again going back to your high school, that should or even you know, middle school would be four pi r squared. The volume of a sphere is four by three pi r cubed. So if I take the ratio of that, the, the basically that ratio scales as one over r. One over r, where r is the radius of the particle, right? Now, if I take the ratio for a one millimeter radius particle, okay, the ratio comes out to be 10 cube or, or, 10, uh, or 1000, right? And for a 10 nanometer radius particle, the ratio comes out to be 10 power eight. So that's 100,000 times larger than what you would find for a one millimeter radius particle. So if I have the same weight of these two particles, what, I, what, what the implication is that I have more number of surface atoms for the nanoparticle compared to what I, have, what I would find in a, simil, in, in, uh, in a one millimeter radius particle. Now surface atoms, so basically my properties of these, of these particles now uh, are determined by the surface atoms because we have more fraction of them covering the surface compared to a, to a large particle where, where it's mostly dominated by the bulk properties. And it turns out that surface atoms are mo more reactive in nature. Okay. So one application of that, of course, because the surface atoms are more reactive is of course in catalysis, energetics. So basically we can actually use this as a catalyst in converting one form of uh, compound to another form. And also in energetics, like nanothermites, for example. Now, again, if you may be familiar with this. Nanothermites are the one, basically, when you, when you use your fireworks, uh, the, the thing that is creating that firework is basically the, the thermite, of course, in the macro scale. But when I make the same material in the nano scale, a thermite is nothing but a mixture of an oxidizer and a fuel. So if I have an oxidizer, for example, and, and a fuel, uh, for example, copper oxide and aluminum, uh, and I make them in the nanoscale, I, 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 and I mix them so that they are nicely homo homogeneously mixed, I make what is called a nanothermite material. Okay. This is what I mean. So you got some micron uh, thermite that you, that you would find in your fireworks. And when, it, when I make this in the nanothermite and when, when I ignite them, the rate of reaction is much higher because again, the surface atoms are very reactive. Uh, the volume is so small, the, the the rate at which the reaction propagates is going to be extremely high. So you can actually compare the rate of energy release to that of typical uh, explosive materials like TNT, for example. And of course, you can also go one step ahead because it's very challenging to actually make a nanothermite where your oxidizer and fuel are mixed homogeneously in the first place. So there are other approaches to basically self-assemble them. So you take this uh, oxide or the fuel and then assemble around this fuel 
uh, your uh, oxidizer. Okay, and that basically make, becomes an ordered nanothermite material. All right. So, and people have done it. As a matter of fact, uh, this was some work that was done uh, at Misu, at University of Missouri, by my colleagues, uh, and they actually showed that this can be done. Uh, and it was, and it had some very interesting applications that I would like to share uh, here. Okay. So. When I make these nanothermites, we have a lot more flexibility in terms of tuning the reaction rate. Okay, so one way is, of course, one uh, application to that is to make sure that the energy is released more controllably. So here, this, uh, this example actually shows a potential application towards microthrusters. So we can actually use these nan nanothermite materials uh, in spacecraft navigation. Okay, so you can actually use this to navigate in space by using this for, as a microthruster. Uh, because these are nanoscale materials, I can actually, these are more amenable to, mini, mini, to application on a chip. For example, here, what, we what uh, this video shows, you actually have a very small amount of this material that is placed on a microchip. So you can actually ignite them on micro scales, microchip, okay? And you can actually apply them. So you have an explosion, an explosion uh, something that you cannot create with uh, other explosive molecules. You can create it at, in the micro scale okay, and create shock waves at the micro scale. Now, and uh, my colleagues at uh, University of Missouri, they actually showed that using these shock waves that are created from a microchip using this nanothermite material, they can actually send foreign materials. They can actually transfect cells, cellular medium. You can actually send materials like particles into cells. You can, you can uh, actually transfect with DNA into the cells and make sure and, and uh, work with the genome of that uh, of that cell. Okay. So it's actually very, very so so one aspect of making or one consequence of making something nano is that the surface area to volume ratio increases drastically, and the surface atoms start to dominate. Okay. Now, what about going back to the gold particle of our observation? Why does gold appear to be why does gold appear to be uh, wine red when I make them small, right? Again, to understand that, let's we need to understand a little bit about resonance, okay? And the fact that why does gold appear to be reflective in the first place, right? Uh, we all experienced looking at gold. Uh, light shine when when I shine light on gold, it gets reflective. Now. What it means is whatever light is falling, or whatever photons, light consists of photons that are falling on gold, basically gets reflected. Now, that doesn't mean that gold does not penetrate into the gold. It's, uh, that doesn't mean that the, the light does not penetrate into the gold. The light does penetrate, but to a very small depth, which we call the penetration depth, about 10 nanometers or so, depending on the metal, okay? And gets reflected, okay? Now, then that's why gold basically appears very reflective in the bulk scale. So only the surface atoms sees the gold, uh, sees the light, okay? The, the light that is sh shining on gold. So now to understand why these gold particles actually, gold nanoparticles look, uh, look wine red, right? We need to again, take a look at uh, resonance, the phenomenon of resonance. So what it means is any oscillating structure basically has what is called a natural frequency of oscillation. That's the frequency it wants to oscillate the most, the, with most efficiency. That's if I, so if I provide energy at that frequency to that oscillating object, it tends to absorb that energy more efficiently. And this is what happened uh, in this example, the Tacoma Bridge. Uh, I don't know if you, have, you must have known this, you must have seen this video before on YouTube. But what happened here is this bridge starts oscillating on a, on a nice uh, windy day. And uh, it turns out that it becomes basically this, is, this becomes an oscillating structure. It has its own resonant frequency, or, or uh, we call that the natural frequency. Okay, and it and it so happened that on that day the wind, the, the for whatever reason the wind speed was such that it basically drive this oscillations to its resonant frequency of the of the bridge. So once it's hit the resonant frequency, the oscillation the the bridge basically absorbed all the energy into and and converted them that that to oscillation. And finally, basically it oscillated with very high amplitudes and, uh, and unfortunately the bridge, bridge collapsed. Okay. So 
So any oscillating structure, it, can, it doesn't have to be a physical mechanical structure. It can be an optical oscillator. It can be a mechanical oscillator. It can be even an electrical oscillator. It's associated with the frequency called uh, the natural frequency. Of course, we, even we as individuals have some frequency associated with that in terms of thought, right? We, that's why we gel with some people where the frequencies match. And that's when we go, go into resonance. So that's the resonance phenomenon. Now, I would like, you, like to introduce a little bit about the light. Uh, and uh, of course, light uh, is an electromagnetic wave. It's a wave um, basically consisting of oscillating, oscillating uh, electric and magnetic fields, okay? Again, in the simplest terms, an electric, electric field is, you can think about it as a force that can, that can, that charges respond to, okay? Electrons are contained in metals, okay? Free electrons are contained in metals, and these electrons can respond to these electromagnetic fields that are contained in, in the light. So what we have here is the light, is, is basically the, uh, uh, what we have is basically the electromagnetic wave spectrum, okay? And depending on the frequency of light, you have different regions of the spectrum. So basically you have radio waves uh, go, going from high frequency gamma rays, X-rays, to all the way to low frequency radio waves. And then you have this visible light in a very small spe uh, spectrum of uh, frequency. Okay, so that's the visible light. When I combine all this light, these frequencies, of course, I get the white light. Okay, and that's why when I shine white light through a prism, uh, again, it, that basically spreads into its spectrum, right? Okay, so white light is composed of all of these frequencies. Now, when I'm shining this light on a gold particle, a gold particle that is so small that uh, uh, the, 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 the smaller than the penetration depth of the metal itself. What happens then? Now, all the particle, all the electrons that are present in the particle would actually see this electric field from the, from the light, right? Now, this is different from the bulk. When my bulk, most of the atoms in the, or the electrons in the bulk does not even see the electric field from the light because light is basically getting reflected. On the other hand, when I make them so small, my, all of these electrons are actually seeing that oscillation, seeing that electric field, and when the frequency of the light matches the resonant frequency of oscillation of these electrons, you can remember that this electric field is a force that acts on charged particles. Electron is a charged particle. Electrons can respond to light, electromagnetic fields in the light, or, or the oscillating electric field in the light. So the electron starts to oscillate. Now, when my light frequency matches the electron oscillation, natural frequency, of course, all the energy is coupled to the electronic oscillations and all the light energy is coupled to the oscillation. So basically you lose the light, the light is being absorbed by the particle. Okay. So for example, for a gold particle, what it turns out that the, uh, for most of the nanoparticles of gold, the absorption uh, or the resonant frequency happens sometimes in, somewhere in the green region. So that means all the light in the green or the green, green light is being absorbed into oscillations. So because green light is absorbed, what you see is what is not absorbed but which is basically the red light. So that's why you see uh, these particles as red. So what can we do about this? What are the applications of this? Now, because it's a resonance phenomenon, so that's, where, that's very important. Because it's a resonance phenomena, it, uh, the way it absorbs the light, it absorbs it with very high efficiency, okay? So we call it, we, we, the technical term for that is extinction coefficient. So a particle having a large extinction coefficient would tend to absorb more light. Okay. So for gold particles, the extinction coefficient is very high because of this resonance phenomenon. And it tends, so even with few nano, through few particles of gold, I can actually see it as very nice, intense uh, coloration. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why these are actually being used for quick diagnostic tests. So these are the gold strips. Uh, if you have seen one of this, uh, a simple example would be a pregnancy test strip that, that actually uses gold particles to get you that line. Uh, yes or no answer, right? That's actually made of these gold particles, gold nanoparticles. Why? Because these can give you very sensitive readouts because all I need is a few, nano, few particles of gold and that can give you a very nice intense coloration, okay, as you can see here. Okay? Now, because these can absorb gold, this light very efficiently, we can actually use it for other applications like photovoltaics in this case. 
Okay, so I can actually have a have a solar cell, photovoltaic cell, uh, combine these gold nanoparticles in the architecture so that this can augment the absorption of solar light and and convert them to electrons or or your electrical power. Okay, and people are working with different configurations, different architecture, in combining these uh, res resonant particles to increasing the efficiency of your solar cells. So again, the applications are not limited to that. Uh, this is again uh, an image from uh, the 1966 movies, the sci-fi movies, The Fantastic Voyage. It's actually a very good movie, I watched it. Uh, if you have a choice, I think you should watch it too, if you haven't already done that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's again, it's a sci-fi movie. The idea is here is that there's, uh, there's a bunch of scientists who basically come up with a way to, uh, to actually shrink themselves uh, into this size, okay? And so the idea is that if you have a patient there who needs uh, some kind of a brain surgery. And these scientists basically shrink, they, they make prepare this kind of a spaceship looking kind of a device, uh, craft, okay? That can actually go through the body. So they shrink them, themselves and this kind of a spacecraft looking thing. And uh, they enter this and then they get injected into the body. And they navigate to the right to the, to the tumor site, if I remember well, and then they start repairing the tumor. Okay, so that's the idea behind this. And uh, and as a matter of fact, of course, we are not trying to shrink the scientists. We are not there yet. But what people are really looking into through this nanotechnology is: can we actually prepare something like that? Can we actually prepare particles that can do all of this? Or prepare particles that can be self-driven to the site where we want the particles to be attached. Can we actually prepare particles that can, you know, that, that can actually uh, uh, have a drug load, drug payload uh, within the particle? So basically, you can imagine having a porous particle, filling that with drugs, right? And then modify the surface with certain uh, molecules, some receptors that can actually target the uh, the site that we want to target within the body. So you inject these particles. The idea is you inject these particles, and these particles autonomously. Uh, direct themselves to the targeted site and then deliver the payload, the, the drug payload, or this particle themselves can be made radio radioactive. For example, you can have gold particles that can be made radioactive uh, as a radioisotope and be driven to the to the target site and do the do the need for. Okay? So again, so there are multiple different applications. As I mentioned before, nanotechnology is is a very highly multidisciplinary field with application ramifications that are beyond. Uh, beyond what we can imagine, okay. All right, so that's one effect of making things into the nanoscale. The other effect is what is called the quantum confinement effect. Okay. So for certain materials like semiconductors, okay, what you have is a band gap, okay. Uh, again, I don't want to go into too much technical here, but what, so the analogy, a good analogy for that would be a room full of students. So you have a large room, like a seminar room, for example, you have a bunch of students, a full room, and uh, and you don't have the instructor there. So what you hear is basically noise, right? You have all the students talking among themselves. And if a new person comes and tries to make out anything, you just cannot make out anything because it's all noisy. Now, what happens when I start shrinking the size of the room, right? Now, as I start shrinking the size of the room, of course, the number of people I can fit in, inside the room is also going to be lower and lower, right? Now, as I shrink the size to a certain level where I have just a few number of students. Now what the students talk, I can actually make out. As an external observer, I should be able to make out the, uh, what, what individual students are actually talking about. And that's, that analogy can be applied in the case of the quantum confinement. So what you have here is a semiconducting material that has these uh, continuous states, continuous energy states where the electron can occupy any of these energy states. And of course you have the band gap. Now as I shrink the size of this, semiconducting material, what you have is you have the discretization. And before it was continuous, noisy, now we have discrete, you can actually make out, right? And interestingly, the band gap also changes. So now uh, this, this semiconducting material containing electrons, now I can actually hear what the electron does in a way, okay? Just to go back to the analogy of the students. So that's the idea. So when I make this material, semiconductor started, started to start with the semiconductor material and make them smaller and smaller. 
it turns out that they can actually make, they can actually start emitting light, light at different frequencies. That's, that's, that's the important thing. And we call them quantum dots. Again, this is a term that uh, has become very popular in the recent years, ever since we had the quantum dot uh, LED televisions. And in fact, we actually use them, use these quantum dots uh, to make the picture bright and nice and colorful. So the idea is you make this, you, you have these semiconducting, semiconducting materials, the same semiconductor at different sizes emits light at different frequencies, as you can see here. So you can be swear it's a highly tunable process that can actually get you different frequencies of light uh, as a function of size of the particle. Same material, different sizes, different frequencies. So very, uh, and of course, the quality of the light is also very sharp. So what you have, here is a very sharp peak at that frequency, in this case, the blue frequency. In this case, it's the green frequency and so on. So you can actually tune this across the entire spectrum and the quality of the light itself is very, very, very sharp. So that's why you don't have, uh, you don't have any interference with other colors here. And that's why your image in a, in a quantum dot LED TV is much more vibrant. The colors are much more vibrant in that television. And of course, the applications of these quantum dots uh, span more beyond quantum dot LEDs. Uh, you can apply them for light emitting diodes. Uh, again, you can use a single frequency of light, blue light, to actually excite them and to emit light in different frequencies. In catalysis, photoconductors, photodetectors, in imaging applications, and photovoltaics. All right, so that's about quantum dots. Um, now, let's talk about uh, so that's so. Now we're gonna shift the gear and look at uh, how we can actually produce them. How are they made in the first place? So when we looked at what happens as size gets smaller, there are two different or three different uh, scenarios. One is the surface area to volume ratio increases drastically. Surface atoms become more, surface atoms are more reactive. Surface atoms tend to dominate the properties of, the, of these materials. The other effect is of course the resonance effects that we just saw and the quantum confinement effect. Okay. Now, moving forward, how do we produce them? Right now, in terms of microtechnology, uh, just to give the, to get the perspective, we had these huge instruments. We have these huge instruments that can, that can, that can actually be used to make uh, micron scale structures. Okay, micron is 10 power minus six of a meter. Uh, nano is 10 power minus nine. So three orders of magnitude difference between micro and nano here. Okay. Now, when it comes to nano scale, it's really hard to produce equipment that can actually manipulate these nanoparticles or nanosystems, okay? So we have to come out with some innovative ways that we can actually make them and, and utilize them. Okay, so there are two different approaches. You have top-down approach where you start with a large object and cut down the size and try and make them into smaller objects, okay? And you have the bottom-up approach where you start with atoms or molecules and build them up. Okay, so from the bottom up. So there are two different approaches and two, two different approaches are becoming more and more popular. So, and of course you can actually combine them as well uh, to make these, these very interesting structures. So the top down approach, as I mentioned, again, you basically take a bulk and uh, material and then start making, and then here you shoot a, shoot a bullet and you have the fragments that are much smaller, right? And you can do that in the nanoscale as well. So here's an example of that. Again, some work that is uh, that has been done or that is being currently being done at Missouri. Uh, so what you have in this case is basically a target. Okay, let's say you want to make uh, gold nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles, that for that matter, or platinum nanoparticles. So you take a target, like basically a, a target, a, a bulk target of platinum, and you bombard that with ions. Of course, not bullets, but ions of a molecule, a high energetic ions. You target high energetic ions onto this target and basically that just putters out these nanoparticles from the target. And these are what you see here. So uh, as you can see here, these are extremely small. That's the, the scale bar is 20 nanometers. So you can see that, that are, these particles are much smaller uh, than even one nanometer. So, so that's one approach of doing things. Uh, the other approach is through the use of uh, molecules. 
molecules are templates. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea about this, so again, this is something that uh, we use every day. Here is a molecule that is called an amphilic molecule. A molecule, again, this is a single molecule is basically this. You have a head group that has, that is, um, hydro, this should be hydrophilic head group and the hydrophobic tail group. Hydrophobic is something that doesn't want to interact with water. Hydrophilic is something that uh, it wants to interact with water. It can, it, it's comfortable in, the, in a water environment. Okay. So when you, when you make a molecule where you have both of these functionalities on the same molecule, hydrophilic head group, hydrophilic tail group, and when you put that in water, what happens, right? And this is something that we do every single day. When we take our shower, we are using soap. Soap is essentially an amphilic molecule. Now the idea is when it's in water, it doesn't, so it wants to organize itself into the structure, okay? Where, of course, I show the 2D cross-section, but what you actually have is the three-dimensional mysole, we call them the mysole, where you have the hydrophobic head groups or hydrophilic head groups are all exposed to the water and hydrophilic tail groups are all hidden inside the mysole, okay? So that configuration basically minimizes the interaction of these hydrophobic tail groups because they don't want to interact with water, with the water, and maximizes the hydrophilic head group's interaction with the water. So that's the that's the arrangement that can do that. Okay. Now, when we when we take a shower, all the oils and the dirt that are that is dissolved in the oil gets dissolved in the hydrophobic interior here. And when I when I wash it with water, basically that goes off along with this. So that's how when you take a shower and don't apply the soap, your oils remain on your body. But when I apply the soap, these soap molecules tend to dissolve that into these interiors and get rid of that. Now we can actually use this for some very high tech applications. Okay, so these mysels, as we have just seen, instead of dissolving dirt in that or oils in that, we can actually use these as, as a nanoscale because these are again molecules, these, these are nanoscale molecules or nanoscale structures. We can actually use this as a nanoscale reactor. So I have a nice nanoscale uh, chemical chemi chemical uh, apparatus here, when I, and then making the reaction within this nano this interior, I can actually make a particle out of it that is defined by by, by the size of this micelle. So that's the idea behind this. So the idea is, let's say again, taking the example of gold. Uh, so you start with the gold ion, and you reduce that to form a gold atom. Okay. Now. And then these gold atoms come together and you cap the growth of these gold atoms. Once, this, once a particular size is reached, you cap the, the growth of these gold atoms, or gold, gold particles, so that they remain in the nanoscale instead of trying to, instead of actually making them into a bulk gold. Okay. And how can we do this? Again, this is all beaker chemistry. Most of the particle synthesis happens in beakers. So you can actually, you don't really need uh, a high infrastructure to actually make them. And actually, all you need is basically a, a, a hot plate, few chemicals, and a beaker, and you, you are actually able to make these gold nanoparticles, or for that matter, any particles. All right. So that's one way of doing this. And over the years, chemists have come up with different techniques, beaker chemistries, to make them into different sizes, different shapes, different sizes, uh, because these re the resonant properties of especially metal particles uh, the catalytic properties of these particles really depends on the shape and the size. Okay, so here, here you have nano flowers that are made, nano prisms, triangles, nano wires, nano bars, dumbbells, you name it, the, 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 the chemists have made it. Okay, so, so, so yeah, much progress has been made over the years in the synthesis and uh, studying the fundamental properties of these particles. Okay, so so now we are at a stage that, uh, or at least we are the chemists and the physicists are at a stage where they're comfortable with making these particles, studying their properties and, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, we, are, we also have some applications of, this prop, uh, of these particles as we have just seen. Now, moving forward, what can we do with this? Okay. What can we do with this? We can actually build macro scale structures okay. where we start with nanoparticles as building blocks and putting together bottom up and try to make an actual structure uh, that you can actually touch and feel where you still preserve the nanoscopic properties of these particles and obtain new functionality for these materials, for new materials, okay? 
Now, and it it lends itself to a, a very broad design scope, right? Now you can talk about combining different properties, different materials into building these uh, macro scale structures from these nanoscopic building blocks. So it basically opens up new opportunities in mechanical engineering, electronics, photonics, new materials, new structures, and so on. So we call them artificial solids with artificial properties, as in these, some, these properties that, that cannot be seen in, uh, in nature, right? And we call them metamaterials because these are not uh, directly observable in nature. So how can we do this? Right. Now, to get a perspective of what kind of applications we can look into, uh, using these kind of materials. Let's uh, again relate that to really how to make yourself invisible. This is something that I, I'm sure, at least, I, at least as a kid, I was wanted to be invisible. I grow up, at least have the technology of making myself invisible. Okay. Now, so how can one make oneself invisible? Now, before we actually describe that, how can we need to understand how we are able to see things as they are, right? Now, the fact that I'm seeing an object that I can recognize happens because you know, light is falling on that object and the object scatters the light or the photons and the scattered photons are being captured by my eye and my brain basically makes a picture out of the scattered photons. So every object will have its own scattering profile, right? An apple will have its own scattering profile a mango will have its own scattering profile and so on and so forth. And that's how we recognize images, recognize people and so on. It's, a, it's actually a very complex process. Your brain is processing all the time, uh, which we really don't pay much attention to. Okay, so that's the deal. So we, when, when we see something, we are really looking at the scattering profile of that object. Okay, now so how, with that, how do we make one sense invisible? One way of making oneself invisible is uh, if we can uh, do something so that the object stops scattering the light, right? Because, uh, or in other words, if I can make the object, the optical properties of the object to be similar to that of air, right? If I do that, then light would just propagate through the object as if there is nothing and you make yourself invisible. Now, that proposition, I would say is a lot more challenging than, for example, the other way approach, as you can see, the, and again, that was the approach that was detailed in, the no, in this particular novel, uh, popular novel, The Invisible Man. Okay, so you lower the refractive index or the optical property of yourself to that of air to become invisible. The alternate approach is to see if you can actually bend light, right? So when I shine light on an object, instead of that object scattering the light in all directions, if I can actually bend the light above me and around me, and then basically it basically bends, the, if I can create a cloak that can do that for me so that the light gets bent around me and rejoins on my back, then for an observer that is sitting at the back, he would see as if he would, uh, he would basically see, my, he see me as being invisible, right? Because the light is, the light is basically entering through me. So that's the other right. The, that's the alternate way of making yourself invisible. And this is, this is the, the idea that was actually popularized in this particular uh, movie uh, or novel for the Fantastic Four, okay? especially the invisible woman. So, so you basically bend all the wavelengths of light in the vicinity around herself without causing any visible distortion. So basically that's, that's another alternate approach of making yourself invisible. Okay, so can we actually bend light? Of course, we can bend light. Uh, that happens all the time. You're, you're, when you're observing something through your microscope, you're, al you're already bending light, right? You have lenses that can bend light. And it also happens in nature uh, in, in, in the form of mirages. Mirages is basically, this is an effect that, that occurs because of the bending of light. So what really happens here, right? So you have, on a, and you must have observed it on hot summer days when you're traveling on roads, uh, this, this mirage, mirage effect, right? So in a hot desert, what you have is you have the desert soil or the desert sand that is super, that is much hotter than the surrounding air. 
And as you go away from the surface, the air gets uh, cooler and cooler, right? So the air that is present right at the surface is extremely hot. And as you go, go up, uh, it, it gradually cools down. So basically what you have is a gradient in temperature of the air surrounding the sand uh, on, on a hot desert. Okay. Now it turns out that the optical properties, the refractive index uh, of, uh, of air is dependent on the temperature. So the refractive index of air, air that is close to uh, the sand is at a different refractive index than what you would find at the, uh, at the very top. Okay. So what you really have is basically a gradient of refractive indices here. And when you have a gradient of refractive indices, the light basically gets uh, bent. And that's exactly what happens in a mirage. Basically light gets bent and light coming, the, the scattered photons from this, uh, let's say the tree gets bent and reaches your eye. And it appears as if you're actually seeing this tree as a reflection over here. Okay. Again, it's basically an Ill illusion that happens because of the way the light bends because of the gradient in refractive indices. Okay. Now, how can we do the light bending in real life? Can we actually do that so that we can actually make ourselves invisible? That will be a very nice, uh, at least I, I would say that will have a very uh, broad application potential. Of course, people can misuse it, but I think that will be something fascinating if some, somebody are able to do that. And people are, have done that, uh, of course not, as a full length cloak, but they have demonstrated that bending of light and cloaking effect on, on a chip, on a microchip, okay? So what you have here, just to describe it, is a flat surface. When I have a flat surface, of course, when you shine light, let's say this is a reflect, reflective surface. When I shine light on this, of course, this surface would reflect light, right? So that's something that you can actually experience. Now, when I place an object on this particular surface, I shine light on that object, Again, depending on the scattering profile that we just talked about, uh, specific to that object, the object scatters light in all directions, right? So if I were to see the object, right, I will be able to recognize this object based on the scattering profile of this object. Now, can I actually design a cloak that, can I play, that I can place on top of this object, shine light over this object and obtain a reflected light that is similar to this profile, as if you have don't you don't as if you do not have any object within that cloak, because if, if you can do that, then of course this basically becomes your cloak. So you apply the cloak, you shine the shine the light, and you would basically get the reflected light as if you have nothing there present. Okay, so that's the idea behind the cloak. And people have demonstrated on on a chip uh, in this way. Okay, so. This is a silicon slab and the way they have manipulated the refractive index of silicon is by drilling holes. It's very similar to, you know, uh, similar to a sponge, for example, right? Now, if I have a dense material, it's very dense. It has intrinsic, intrinsic properties of that material, right? And if I drill holes in that and take out some material out of that, then, the weight of the material is going to reduce because now I have my air is being re, is replacing that material in that holes, right? Air is lighter than that material, the material becomes light. And in, in similar way, we can also talk about in terms of optical properties. Now, in a silicon wafer like this, if I drill these holes, then the optical properties of this region is, is influenced by how much of air I have packed in that holes. So that becomes a weighted average of how much silicon I have in this particular region and how much air I have in that particular region. So now this way I can actually control the refractive index. I can basically have a gradient refractive index and I can bend light in different ways. So we basically drill holes and, and you can see this, this is the cloaked area. So what you have is a mirror here, that's the mirror. That's supposed to be the cloaked area and that's your cloak. And you can see here that the, the holes and the way they're arranged is different than, than what you would see here. You have a gradient of this distribution of the holes. So what you basically get is a gradient refractive index that can bend light 
uh, in what place you want, want it to bend. And this is what we have from the simulation. This is actually a paper that was published in, in science, I believe. Uh, so this is the cloaked region. I shine light. This is the light in the simulation that is shined, shown on this cloak. This is the cloaked region. And that's the reflected light, as if there is nothing there, as if you have, don't have anything. In the absence of this dotted cloak, as you can see here, now you have a scattering profile. Light is, light is being incident and it's getting scattered. That is uh, specific to the shape of this, uh, that's specific to this shape, right? So the cloak, in the presence of the cloak, this is cloaked, this region is cloaked. In the absence of the cloak, of course, you don't have any cloaking effect. So that can be done. So if we, all we need to find is a way to modify the refractive index around you, or to modify the optical properties of the surrounding medium around you. If you are able to do that in a macro scale, then we have a cloak. Okay. Of course, it's not simple. As, and, and of course, my uh, although my research is a little bit related to this, but uh, again, I'm not really working on cloaks to make oneself invisible. That would be a pretty cool way, cool technology, though. I'm sure somebody is working out there on that technology. So, how do we steer light? As I mentioned again, uh, it's by if we can control the optical properties of the medium. When I say the optical properties, I refer to the electrical permeability, permittivity, and the magnetic permeability of space around uh, of, of space. If I'm able to do that, then I can actually steer light in unprecedented ways. Something that that we can still do with limited success on chip on a on a small scale chips, we can still do that. Uh, again, it's still proof of concept. It's not still pretty difficult to achieve that feat but something that can be at least attempted, okay? Uh, without going into much details, this is basically the, the, the fundamental equation that governs the propagation of light in a medium. Again, that's the Maxwell's uh, wave equation. So the, the parameters the, that really matter in the propagation of light are these two parameters. The mu, which stands for permeability, magnetic permeability, and epsilon. If I'm able to control these two values somehow, then I can basically steer light in whatever ways I want to. Okay. Now, what are the applications of this? Are we do, of course, you know, cloaking on a chip is fun, demonstration of this, te this uh, technology, but what are the application, what are the uh, implications of this technology? Okay. So what we have here is, uh, uh, so, so you can apply this for, preparing these uh, integrated optical integrated circuits on a chip, okay? Now, the deal with optics is that you can actually, uh, and the something that you cannot do with electronics is that uh, with optics, you can actually have very high switching switching rates. The zero, again, as you know, your computers works on zeros and ones, right? You're always, your whole logic works on zeros and ones. So the faster you can switch from zero to one or one to zero, the faster, is your computational speed. With light, I'm able to switch at a very fast rate. With electrons switching from one state to the other, it's not as fast. With light, I can do that. So people are researchers are actually working on optical integrated circuits. So we need somehow to guide light on these structures. We have to mix light, we have to filter light. So all of these structures can be implemented if I'm able to implement, uh, implement this technology of uh, controlling the mu and epsilon of space, okay, of materials. All right, so going back to the previous example, one way of doing that is on silicon. This is the silicon chip and, uh, right, and, and currently this is the only way to do that actually. Uh, you drill holes and the properties of this material now depends, now is the weighted average of the optical properties of uh, air and the material. And this is the actual structure that was fabricated and demonstrated in this particular journal. Okay, and for for small scale structures, for proof of concept demonstration, for prototyping, this works. Uh, but for if you want to really make it mainstream, that's something that's uh, not feasible because these are fabricated using very sophisticated equipment, and the throughput is not there. So we have to come up with alternate technologies. And there, that's where 
my research comes into picture, uh, at least uh, for what we what we do here, or what, what we are trying to attempt, or what we are attempting to do here, here is actually making use of nanoparticles as building blocks. Okay, and as I mentioned before, you know, you, you have properties of nanoparticles. We can use the individual nanoparticles for applications. Uh, the other way of going around that is to actually use these nanoparticles and build materials out of it, build macro scale structures out of it. Okay. So in this case, we use these nanoparticles to build a porous structure or porous film, okay, where we have nanoparticles that are, you know, organized and the space between the, or the void space between the nanoparticles is basically your air. So now we have, depending on how much void space you have, I can tune the optical properties of these of the structures, right? So these are called nanoporous films. The by controlling the porosity or the degree of porosity, I can control the optical properties of these films. How do we do this? How do we? So if I want to make something like this, something like this structure where I have some kind of optical properties here that are different from the optical properties of the film here that are different from the optical properties here, that's not still very trivial to do. That uh, we need to come up with a way where we can actually assemble these particles uh, so that these particles assemble in, uh, in, in, in a manner that is uh, predictable, that is programmable. And this is what we do. We want to rely or we want to utilize the techniques of self-assembly. We want to make these nanoparticle films and allow them to assemble themselves. We provide them with the right conditions, right thermodynamic conditions, and let them assemble themselves. Self-assembly is something that's happening all the time. We just mentioned the example of the soap mysore, the soap, how the soap works. That basically works through self-assembly. Your molecules are coming together to self-assemble, and we are we are basically leveraging that self-assembly to clean ourselves every day, right? Self-assembly, uh, again, to be more generic, uh, we are products of self-assembly. As human beings, your proteins are extremely complex molecules that are self-assembled molecules uh, and, and your entire structure, your sum of different parts, it, it basically, basically uh, are products of self-assembly. So can we actually utilize self-assembly to create functional nanostructures, functional structures, right? So in this example, I would like to use the surface itself because in the nanoscale, the surface really matters, okay? The interfaces really matter. Can I use the surface of my substrate where I want to deposit these nanoparticles and I and somehow control the movement of the nanoparticles so that in so that in one region uh, I have more dense packing of the nanoparticles, whereas in other region I have more loose packing of the nanoparticles, so you have more wide spaces, and uh, that way I can control the spatial uh, optical properties of the structure of the film. So that's the idea behind this. People have done that. People have, uh, at least uh, in terms of demonstrating the assembly of nanoparticles, providing with them with the right condition, people have demonstrated that before, okay? So the idea here is you take nanoparticles, a two component system, you have nanoparticles and polymers. So a mixture of these particles in polymer, you deposit that as a thin film, okay? And then heat it, okay? And through, thermodynamic driven segregations or thermodynamic driven processes, these nanoparticles can be made to self-assemble. So into basically these ordered structures like these, or in this extreme example where you, where, uh, you have a coating with cracks and you drive these nanoparticles to actually fill the cracks through self-assembly, through thermodynamic. Basically you provide them, them with the right conditions and these nanoparticles can be driven to fill the cracks and seal that uh, crack surface. So in future, this is a this is most this is this 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 may be a possibility where you have a scratched paint on your car, and all you have to do is just apply some uh, a dryer on there, and then that will basically self heal. But that that that's a possibility in the, in the in the coming future. That's what this at least these scientists wanted to demonstrate in this example. Okay. All right. So here this is again going back to our own research. Where, uh, where we have, what we have done here is using the substrate effects, the, su the surface of the substrate itself to drive the nanoparticle to assemble in different ways. Of course, and uh, before I play the video here, what I want to show is you have a film 
that is of nanoparticles and polymer deposited on over a surface where I have modified the surface to be different in different regions with different chemical functionality. Okay. Now, the moment I place it on a hot plate, the nanoparticles are given energy, the heat energy, and the nanoparticles move, they self-assemble themselves, okay? And uh, depending on the substrate itself, depending on what is on the substrate or depending on the region where the, they, are, they are present, they assemble into dense regions or highly porous regions, okay? Now you cannot see the nanoparticles themselves, but you can see the macroscopic effect of that because when I do this, as you can see here, In this particular video, it started out as a homogeneous film. However, the moment I place it on the hot plate, the nanoparticles that are present in this region, the white regions, they form a completely a film with completely different refractive indices. And that's why you can actually see them as white. The optical properties are different. The way they interact with light is different. That's why you see a different color. On the other hand, you have these pattern regions here where the particles are assembled differently. They are more tightly packed in these, in these dark regions. And that's why the optical properties are different and use that and then manifest as a different color. So we can actually see that. We can actually do that. We can actually use self-assembly thermodynamics to actually drive these nanoparticles to, to assemble in different ways. And our ongoing research is to see if you can, right now it's binary, right? We can actually have one or the other. Now we want to see if we can actually get gradient profiles so that we can actually actually make uh, the, the structures, the optical structures much more simplistically as you have demonstrated, as we have demonstrated on here. All we have to do is just prepare that substrate, put it on the hot plate, and you get that optical structures within a few minutes. Okay? And that basically opens up new avenues for nanostructure engineering. All right. So, so we are almost there. So in conclusion, I would like to conclude now. I, 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 I know during, the, during my introduction, we want, I wanted to also talk about some other applic exciting applications, but again, there are too many exciting applications to actually present in this, uh, in this limited amount of time. So I just want to stop here, concluding that, yes, there is indeed plenty of room at the bottom, as Dr. Rich, Richard uh, Feynman famously uh, conjured. Uh, nanotechnology does offer a lot of opportunities, and of course, we have risks associated with that as well. We have to be, we have to make sure we need to understand those risks, uh, the environmental risks, the health issues associated with working with these nanomaterials, and so on. Again, this is a highly interdisciplinary field. It's affecting every field that you can conceivably think of, and it has to. We have to be, of course, we have to adopt a prudent approach in advancing these technologies, so that common, common uh, people can actually adopt them into their daily lives. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, let me conclude. And uh, regarding the super lubricity, which I promised initially, uh, this, is a, this is some work that was done by our neighbors in Argon National Labs, actually very interesting work, where they actually use 2D materials. Now, I just didn't want to start with 2D material because that's, again, an ocean of uh, new information. Uh, so. So if, that's why I provided this link. Actually, it's very informative. This is written for general public. So I welcome you to actually use that link for this. With that, I thank you. And uh, I open up the floor for discussions and comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. K uh, Karma Pali. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very good. And I, I'm sure that we would appreciate some of the discussion as we um, come back after a few minutes and people put in some questions about some of those applications that you were talking about. That was okay. highly interesting with uh, the bridge and uh, your shower example and just how uh, people like that are in this field really take a look at very ordinary things and mm -hmm. think about them differently, which yeah. I thought was very intriguing. Uh, so just taking a look at everyday things, I think uh, it would be neat to have a few examples of just what would we be missing in our everyday life if we didn't have this technology. And maybe we can talk about that in just a couple minutes. We did get a, a question in there, but we'll wait for a few more. 
while we're waiting uh, for people to put in a few more comments or uh, questions, I do want to remind you that our next STEM Cafe is uh, going to be uh, about um, the Unlocking the Climate Secrets of the Polar Regions, and it's scheduled for February 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, also, uh, I wanted to tell you that our speaker is going to be Reed Shear, uh, NIU Professor of Geology and Environmental Sciences. Uh, we are still looking for teen leaders for our teen STEM cafes, and we are in partnership with the uh, DeKalb Public Library, uh, and we have had a really good relationships with other libraries. So if you're from another area, please send me an email that you would like to be involved because we, we will be able to invite students from all over the place um, to be a part of this. Uh, because this is a program for teens by teens. Our teens choose the topics, vet the speakers, and manage their own cafes with our supervision. I also have been asked to share with you that they uh, have some after school programs from NIU STEAM. Uh, they're called STEAM Studio. Uh, it is our grades 3 through 12 and registrations are now available if you go online to NIU STEAM website. Uh, they have put a lot of effort into making these programs fun uh, with hands on activities that allow for free choice and exploration. The classes are small enough so that students get to know each other and can do a bit of socializing. And they have one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction uh, with some STEM or uh, STEAM educators. Uh, they are really reasonable, $39 for two weeks after school. And uh, they make great gifts. If somebody's uh, wanting to give a gift for a grandchild or, uh, or one of their own children or a neighbor. Um, and uh, a special perk, anybody from the DeKalb County uh, can uh, get uh, a scholarship uh, if they email me and let us know um, about that person. We can reach out uh, so that we do have scholarships for uh, families with special circumstances. So anyway, um, we look forward to having uh, lots of people involved in that and those registrations are online now. So um, maybe um, you can start talking about some of those everyday applications. Would you mind doing that? That just tells yeah, about um, just what would we not have if we didn't pay attention to this uh, nanotechnology? So one of the applications that I've just shown, uh, right, uh, the Gold nanoparticles in particular are already being used for their properties. They have very high exchanging coefficient. That means they can absorb light more efficiently. So small number of particles can be used to get a very nice intense signal, right? And uh, you can already find them in, in, uh, in diagnostic uh, applications. Like for example, your, uh, your uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, test strips, the diagnostic test strips the rapid diagnostic test steps, so pregnancy test steps. So these are all technologies that are already using gold nanoparticles to make them more, uh, more effective. Then you have uh, pigments. Uh, I, I, I was just reading through the Q&A and it's, it's rightly pointed out, we have actually TIO2 nanoparticles that are not only used in, in pigment to get the nice white color, but you can also find them in uh, UV creams. Uh, these are, can actually have these nanoparticles that are present in, uh, uh, in the creams that you apply, the UV protection creams. Then um, quantum dot LEDs is another example where we actually find these, these uh, products commercially available because the quantum dot technology TVs actually use quantum dots. We have a layer of these quantum dots that are used to that are used in the construction of that television. Um, so moving forward, I think. Uh, you will, you, will, you will be having more and more applications, not only in the diagnostic region in area, but also in other application. Electronics, for example, uh, as we are hitting that, uh, the wall where we want to make, make our transistor size smaller, eventually we have to embrace some kind of an nanotechnology architecture uh, to, make, to, to, uh, to make them functional. Right? So 
So and obviously when once, once that, once that uh, enters into the nano, nano realm, the microelectronics or the, or the electronic realm, of course, uh, all the consumer electronics basically depends on that. Right. I hope that that uh, that made sense. I like how you compared it to some of these um, uh, science fiction um, ideas that we had years ago, and they're actually coming to fr fruition now because of this technology. That uh, you know they might have been laughable, or we thought they could never happen, and and because mm -hmm. of people like you that have a different way of looking at things, um, they are actually becoming reality. Uh, and so I thought that was a really interesting way of presenting it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, so what are uh, some of your students doing? What are some of their first reactions when they start taking some of these classes about this? And, you know, what are their questions? And, you know, how, how do you begin studying this and thinking about it. I think that's very so, intriguing. A little bit of history. Uh, when I came to this country, I was, my major as a bachelor's was uh, electrical engineering, pure electrical engineering. So that was, uh, so I was dealing with machines, big machines. And uh, as a master's project, I was actually working on a micro MEMS device, micro electromechanical system. So it's still in the micro scale. Around that time, uh, I had uh, my advisor. I was introduced to my advisor who was actually working in the nanotechnology. And that kind of blown my mind at that time. I was very intrigued. Uh, I was just, I could not imagine actually be, being able to actually make these structures and actually use them for different applications. So at that time, I just signed out, signed, signed on for my PhD under her and uh, finished it. And uh, now when I, teach when I introduce these concepts in my class, of course, it's kind of, uh, some of the students are highly excited. Some of the students, because, you know, these are not traditional concepts that are, that are taught in engineering classes, right? So, so that's why I, I start with the disclaimer that, you know, you need to open up your minds. You have to bring together different concepts because nanotechnology transcends the different fields. You have, if, you are, if you want to understand this, then you have to embrace biology, chemistry, physics be able to understand this, to have a good uh, appreci appreciation for this field. So that's why I tell my students before I actually embark on teaching this or teaching this concept. And what I've observed is uh, when I take the students to the lab and when they actually get to see this, they are more excited because in the class, it's the, the concepts are still you know abstract, um, but on, in the lab, when they actually do, do, do it hands-on, uh, they are more excited. Uh, we have another question, comment, I guess it's a question. How can you control the local permeability? The local permeability is a little bit more... Uh... Um, could you please repeat the question because I don't know that everybody can see it. Okay. The question is, how can you control the local permeability using nanostructures? And can you do it dynamically in real time? Uh, that's a good question. And at least for long wavelengths that can be done using uh, this splittering uh, resonator structures, but at the very small wavelengths, uh, it's a little bit more challenging than that. We can control the local local permeability, uh, per permittivity, uh, but permeability is a little bit more challenging um, to answer the question, yeah. So if I want to make, control both permittivity and permeability, I need to look at, uh, and then there, are, there, is, there, there is of course literature on that, uh, look at nanocomposites of materials. Now, for the other part of the question about being able to control it dynamically, um, I, okay, I, I may have seen some literature on that using, what is it called? Using piezoelectric materials, but uh, I need to go back and look at that. I, I'm not sure if that can be done dynamically, That's but that's something that will be very 
useful if you are able to do that. So you can, you can actually look at uh, reconfigurable optical systems on the same chip if you are able to do that. So that that's a very good question. Yeah. Okay, can you quantify long and short wavelengths? May I say long, we are talking about um, radio waves, millimeter waves, radio waves. When I say short, as in I'm, I'm referring to the visible frequency. So 5,700 5, angstroms, yes, that's a typical human visible light. That's correct. So long is more in terms of uh, yeah, microwaves and radio waves. Where your structures doesn't have to be very small, you can actually construct micron scale structures, which are easy to do in the lab. You can con construct uh, reconfigurable configurable systems at that size scale. Did you answer all of the first question that we had there? Uh, I think so. I. Oh, I think you might have, but I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think there's another question maybe I should. Uh, um, so uh, can you think of uh, some other things that uh, absolutely, um, like tomorrow, if we didn't have this technology, what is it that we would be without? Uh, because we're so dependent on this technology now that we have just taken it for granted. You know, what is something that uh, that we would be very surprised about that, you know, we wouldn't have or that uh, it would impact our life majorly if we didn't have this? So, so I would say nanotechnology is a logical progression that in the technological evolution, we've been making things smaller and smaller, right? So, so if you want to proceed further, uh, we want to embrace this technology and if you did not have one, let me, again, the kind of development that we want to see in different fields in terms of, you know, coatings, in terms of uh, um, diagnostics and therapeutics, we would not be seeing that kind of uh, in the future. I liked what you said about uh, that you tell your students that they have to combine chemistry and physics and a lot of these different science fields in order to understand this. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, one of the scientists from Fermilab said that to our teens one day, he said that so someday I'm a chemist and someday I'm a this. And, mm -hmm. you know, all these science fields blend together and we don't live in a vacuum. We actually, um, you know, might be studying engineering, but we're actually physicists at, as well, and and uh, we and chemists, and we combine all of this to to understand that. So it's it's not pure. Yes. Um, we we are always uh, borrowing and um, bringing together what we know mm -hmm. uh, and taking a look at what we think we knew in a different manner. It seems. Yes. Yes, as time goes by, you know, the fields are not going to be remaining as purely electrical, purely mechanical, or purely basic sciences. Those, those, the boundaries are going to be uh, more blurred over time because that exchange of ideas has to happen. What got you hooked on this field? Again, you know, I, uh, in my lab, I work with... Uh, unconventional fabrication technologies. I want to make things smaller uh, with the processes that are much more simpler. Okay, so it's always, you're always thinking about how to make them uh, you know, in the most efficient manner, more effective manner, cost effective, time effective, and, uh, and so on, right? So, so, so that, that's one thing, you, you have the opportunity to, in, to innovate, right? 
and actually contribute something to your, to the field. And uh, that's one thing. And the, and the other thing is, you know, you're actually using some day-to-day -day life experiences and actually applying them uh, to some very highly sophisticated technologies, right? I just talked about the, um, the example of soap and how soap works and how we can actually use them to make nanoparticles. They take the same, exact same technology to be used, can be used to make you know, nanoparticles and the nanostructures. Uh, so, and the culmination of all these different fields is something that makes it very exciting uh, for me. Just op opens up so much to learn on a daily basis. We have two more uh, questions here. Maybe you could read them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a question, did the imagination that generated science fiction writing leads to the interest in nanotechnology by scientists or did the scientists scientific interest in nanoparticles leads to it starting to appear in science fiction writing in a sense which came first? Again, that's, that, that's like the chicken and egg uh, analogy, I would say. Um, to answer that again, uh, I think the science fiction comes first and we want to make that a rea reality, right? Uh, that's, that's the typical way things happen. I was recently watching the 2001 A Space Odyssey movie and it's, it's remarkable the things that they predicted in that movie, the artificial intelligence and the various different technologies, it's just remarkable. And I was thinking to myself, you know, you, 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 you imagine and then you make them happen, make them, so at least that's my take. I don't know if that's the right answer. And uh, let's see. Well, that's another that question. Person, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that particular person who is attending has probably read everything there is. So he <laughs> is very interested in which came first. Um, and here, here's a, a question. I can read it. I think that... Um, they're asking you, can you talk about specific health implications in clinical settings mm -hmm. and use of nanotechnology? I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Are there more uses in addition to therapeutics and diagnostics? So uh, I think that's interesting. Uh, and in the health fields, what what do we have uh, connected with this in the health fields that, that's absolutely critical to us? Um... Imaging would be another application. Of course, imaging again goes down to diagnostics. Um, at least therapeutics and diagnostics. That kind of covers everything, right? In, in terms of technological applications, are there anything else other than that? E even in general? Therapeutics and diagnostics. Explain that a little bit about those medical tools or whatever those discoveries were that had to do with the medical related to this field. I guess uh, better prosthetics, uh, smart prosthetics and um, artificial skins, human, inter human, uh, human computer interfaces that are more natural, I guess. Uh, exoskeletons, robotics, I would say that feel, touch, and behave like humans in the future. Again, again, these are all of my imaginations. Uh, are we gonna have them with these technologi technological evolutions? Yes, maybe in the future, but these are something that comes to my mind. Uh, again, they seem sci-fi at this time, but uh, who knows in the, in, the, in, the few, in the next few years, maybe we can actually find a humanoid that can actually feel I hope that answers that question. That's highly interesting about the artificial skin and all of that that you're talking and about. People are actually working on that. The artificial skin that can actually sense pressure, temperature, uh, wearable sensors that can actually you know, give you the vitals, measure your vitals and so on. That's very intriguing. Can you think of any other uh, examples of what people are actually researching now? Maybe they haven't come up with it yet, but they're actually looking into it as um, maybe. So one, one open area of research that is, uh, that is still open is the brain 
studying the brain, how brain processes information, how brain memory, how brain uh, thinks, uh, and people and, and and many research groups, uh, at top universities are actually working on that. And there's a lot of big funding being poured into it, into that research, on consciousness and how brain works, uh, how we can actually make instruments that can actually, you know, understand the operation of brain at the, at the same, uh, with very high resolution. Okay. So, so yeah. Can you, uh, what are these uh, four different patents that you have? So I, so the, one of the patent is on, um, uh, on nanoporous film formation. One patent is on a micro device that can do amplification of DNA, like the PCR. Uh, I'm, I'm sure now people, people are more familiar with that, the PCR, right, uh, for the COVID test. So that's a small device that can do that. And uh, two other patents are on nanoparticles, making nanoparticles in bulk. Another one is on patterning nanoporous films, like the directed assembly of nanoporous films that I've just showed you in the presentation towards the end of the presentation. Has any of this um, technology impacted uh, what we're doing uh, to get to the bottom of this pandemic? I mean, is, is this influencing any any aspect of it that you can think of? Uh, which my technology, well, not, not, at least not mine at this time, hopefully in the future. Um, but that's because that's still, field. sorry? The, and the field, I mean, the nanotechnology. Well, I'm sure there is uh, because uh, the rapid strips that, that uh, many leading universities have come up with, like UIUC, most likely they, are, they have some kind of uh, uh, nano involved in it. These are, these are all nano-enabled technologies uh, that, that are finding use in the in current pandemic situation. Yes, at least they, uh, I'm sure Although I don't know all the details about the technology that UIUC uses, but I'm sure that some amount of nano is involved in that. Uh, well, I have one final question. You know, you showed us the bridge and mm -hmm. that something went wrong with it. Can you explain again exactly what went wrong with that bridge? And were there any other major things that happened because people weren't paying attention to nanotechnology? Well, again, the bridge is not necessarily related to nanotechnology. The, the reason why I wanted to present that is uh, just to illustrate the similarity. The, so, so the bridge analogy was basically, you have a bridge that was not meant to be an oscillating structure, of course, that was constructed, the way it was constructed, it turned out to be an oscillating structure, right? So anything that vibrates or oscillates will have what is called a natural frequency, like a spring will have its own natural frequency. And when I oscillate, when I provide energy corresponding to, corresponding to that frequency, then you, I can drive that oscillation into resonance. Okay, so so that's that, that's the analogy I want. I just wanted to present through that uh, through that bridge analogy. So in that particular example, the bridge was oscillating, right? And this wind was blowing, and it, it turns out that the wind was blowing. The, the, the speed of the wind and the weight was blowing it uh, drove the bridge to, to vibrate or oscillate at its natural frequency. And when something oscillates at its natural frequency, it tends to absorb the energy and maximizes, its, maximizes this oscillation uh, amplitude okay? or the intensity of the oscillation. And that's what happened that day. So basically it, it, uh, the, the wind driven that bridge into resonance, the bridge uh, oscillated with, with very high amplitudes because it was under resonance and that led to the breakage, okay? And my point was any resonating structure doesn't have to be a mechanical resonating structure. It can be optical, it can be electrical. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, we resonate with some certain people, right? When we are talking to people, we don't resonate with everybody. We, we, we typically you know, resonate with like-minded people when the ideas resonate. So that's the concept I wanted to just you know, illustrate. And that's what happens in the nanoparticle. Nanoparticle and these charge, charges resonate and uh, absorb the light. And that's why they appear red instead of 
appearing golden, but in the case of the golden gold particle. Just the analogy. Question. <clears throat> we have another question. Yeah. How? What about pressure sensitive materials that could improve touch screens, vehicle skins, etc.? Yes. Uh, in in fact, there are uh, there is research, at least that I know, being done by Northwestern and UIUC, where they are actually making these kind of uh, pressure sensitive. Can very thin pressure sensitive uh, layers that you can actually apply on skin on um, oh let me let me actually read the maybe I'm not will pressure in vehicle skin be used to affect damages in or avoidance of collisions uh, well to uh, or for your real example could clamp technology be used to create warning systems as to likelihood of collapse or hazardous conditions that are more accurate I don't think the people heard the question. Um, okay, so let me read the question. Okay. So what about pressure sensitive materials that could improve touch screens? Yes, I think that's something that can be easily, uh, that we can easily see in the next few years. Vehicle skins, that's a good, good thought uh, to have a vehicle with uh, pressure sensitive skin that can actually feel the touch. So touch of the, you know, touch and temperature and so on. I think that's that's a very good idea. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, that we may see some applications towards that. Could pressure in vehicle skins be used to affect damages or avoidance of collisions? I think uh, we are, if we rely on pressure, we are already too late in terms of collision, right? Uh, so we already have the sensors that can, uh, that can, uh, that can predict uh, collision and avoid collisions. Or for your bridge collapse example, could nanotechnology be used to create warning systems and as to the likelihood of collapse? Yes, I think uh, you have sensors. With, after that example, of course, we have uh, a, lo a lot more development have been done. We have sensors that are placed along the bridge that can predict the health of the bridge. Okay, and of course, uh, you have the maintenance uh, engineers who can get the readings on a timely basis to predict the health of the bridge. Or hazardous conditions that are more accurate? I think so. So in, in the future, we may have sensors uh, that can actually predict environmental hazardous conditions as well, because uh, that can be placed and that can be interconnected into a network, in, into, into some kind of a sensor network and provide a continuous information about not only the health of the bridge itself, but also the environmental conditions. That was gonna be my next question. What's an example of biosensing or environmental sensing? So biosensing would be uh, a biosensor that would uh, sense biologically relevant um, entities, right? Like, uh, like proteins, you wanna detect proteins, you wanna detect metabolites in your system, glucose, so these are all biosensors, um, or for example, DNA, for example, antibodies, viruses, bacteria. So a biosensor would be able to do that, do all of that. Um, environmental sensing, as in uh, you're trying to detect uh, pollutants in the environment, right? Uh, the, the noxious gases in the environment. So these are the sensors that, and it doesn't have to be gases, it can also be liquid-based pollutants. Uh, that these can actually sense. And did you have an example of uh, medical imaging? That, did you say that? Yes, uh, although I did not show them in the slides, uh, nanoparticles or quantum dots can be actually used to lighten up or light up the, uh, the tissue. So basically we can attach quantum dots uh, to particular areas of the tissue to actually image the tissues. And you can also do MRI with these uh, high contrast uh, nanoparticles that are uh, that are uh, injected and then that basically goes and attaches to the specific organs of the body and giving a better contrast in the MRI images. I was highly interested in what you were talking about. Uh, I don't know if it's for coding or what it is uh, for repairs of 
scratches yeah, and that yeah, kind yeah. of thing on cars because I'm anti marks on cars. I'm just <laughs> really <laughs> he's not right. <laughs> I, I'm over the top on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sure. I was interested in that. Oh, yeah. We don't have a coding like that yet, but at least in that paper, uh, they do talk about that in terms of at least they dream about the coding. And people are working on self repairing coding. If you just type in Google, uh, self repairing coding, coding, you will see a lot of literature on how people are trying to do that. Okay. Uh, how the scratch tends, tries to heal itself the addition of some components that would basically be driven to fill the crack and heal the crack in effect. Again, that's not my area of uh, expertise, so I cannot really you know, comment much, but from my, from my general reading, yeah, people are working towards that. So, do we have any more comments for anybody? <clears throat> I would, uh, do you have any real takeaways from our, for our audience? Um, what do you want your students to take away? What do you want us to take away from everything you've said to us tonight? Uh, what do you want to leave us with after this um, uh, really great example of the why and the how and just, you know, that, that whole thing? I mean, I... Uh, I just, what are the takeaways? That the takeaways, we again, the thing is open up your minds uh, to different fields and, uh, and be excited, be, be uh, curious about different things, not just technology, I would say, and general, general observations, right? Uh, just to give you an example, uh, in, one of, in one of the processes that we have developed in the lab, we actually rely on what is called the vortex flows. It's a complicated word, but uh, the observation is actually very simple. And this is something that we must have observed all the time, especially for those who take wine. If you have ever seen, seen uh, like a glass of wine, you would see what is called the tears of wine. Have you observed that? You would see that uh, the sides of the wine, you have, you have the wine going up and falling down in, 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 form, in the form of these, uh, these, uh, uh, these columns. You should observe it next time you have wine. And, that, and, and again, the basis behind that is actually very scientific and very interesting. And we, in one of the process that we, have, we use to assemble nanoparticles or particles, we actually use that uh, analogy, we use that scientific principle to actually assemble these particles. So what I'm trying to say is that on a daily basis, we experience a lot of interesting things that we don't pay attention to. As a simple thing, as simple as seeing something has a pretty, pretty, uh, you know, interesting scientific background behind it. And the way your mind processes or your brain processes that information, it's actually mind blowing. So just open up your eyes to what you see, what you, what you hear, and uh, and just have an open mind. We do have uh, a couple of comments here um, uh, complimenting you on your informative talk. It was a very interesting talk, I agree, and lots for us to think about and go away with after this to take a look at things a little bit differently. Um, and then she has a comment. I, I don't know if you can see the chat comment. Um, um, it says B-A-S-F some time ago developed a self-cleaning glass material don't know what was what used but guessing nano of some kind that was used to make this material this glass material self-cleaning glass material okay so was it a hydrophobic uh, coating of some sort that can be applied maybe because i i know we have worked on similar coatings before uh, coatings that are scratch resistant and so on. And we wanted to make them hydrophobic or super hydrophobic so that uh, when, you, when, when you wash it or when raindrops hit it, uh, it would basically beat up and then take away the dust away from that uh, coating. So, so to get a hydrophobic coating like that, yes, you do, have, you do need some 
nanoparticles to achieve that. So you need some kind of a nanos nanoscopic roughness on the surface to get that hydrophobic effect and the self-cleaning effect. So most likely, yes. So bass most likely must have used some kind of hydrophobic, some kind of nanoparticles in their formulation. What is one thing that your students are just awestruck about when they go to your lab and get so excited about? Um, you said that when you go to the lab that they just really start getting it and really get excited about it. Can you think of one example of that? I always ask students uh, about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was the one thing that just really made you get hooked on this uh, subject? I, I always ask them that at STEM Fest. So the lab that I work in, it's a, it's a clean lab, clean room. So even to enter the lab, because again, we are working with very tiny structures, right? The micro, microscopic and nanoscopic structures. So a dust particle in comparison would be huge. And uh, a dust particle falling on a device would basically ruin the device. So we use these special labs and to, even to enter the lab, you have to be dressed up uh, into these bunny suits, and then cover yourself up and uh, wear the mask. So in a way, you know, even with the pandemic, one of the reasons why my lab is still active is because you know you naturally have to wear that anyway, the, the personal protection equipment. So my students don't have a choice but to go to the lab. Uh, so and they are excited about it. So even just entering the lab itself is uh, is an interesting experience for the students, at least the first time. And, uh, and then looking at the processes and how the nanoparticles uh, are used, made, and, uh, and how are you making these nice, very fine, well-tuned structures, uh, that, 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 that direct witnessing of these uh, the processes is what actually excites them. Yes, I imagine that's a very interesting. My son worked uh, on microchips, making oh, okay. microchips at uh, Micron, Micron, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he wore one of those suits. And yeah, uh, yeah, that that is quite interesting. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was highly interesting. Uh, we made you really work here uh, in the last half hour, um, but we really appreciate it. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I have, uh, it was a, certainly a pleasure to work with you. And I want to remind uh, people of a few things before we leave. Um, again, um, February 17th is the next event. And uh, it's unlocking, unlocking the climate secrets of the polar regions. And um, just, uh, we're kind of I know that uh, the COVID isn't great and the pandemic isn't great, but actually um, our speaker for next time normally would be uh, probably in the Antarctic uh, doing research right now, which is totally awesome. But because um, of this, I, I don't know for sure what his reason is that he's not um, in the Antarctic uh, because this is summer there, but it, it could have something to do with the fact that we're, the world is in, in this pandemic uh, and people aren't traveling any place. But anyway, so we're very privileged to um, have the opportunity to hear him speak and talk about all the environmental um, secrets that he has found uh, in, in the Antarctic. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and again, we welcome your feedback and remember that in the last six months, actually two or three of the topics that we had actually were requested by the, by the audience. So we really <clears throat> do listen to you. We appreciate uh, your attending and we appreciate your suggestions for our STEM cafes. And so you can see my email there. Uh, please do contact me if, to give me feedback and, and your terrific ideas. Uh, remember that today's uh, STEM Cafe was recorded, and uh, if you're interested in sponsoring the STEM Cafe, um, please uh, contact me or go on to our website to NIU STEAM, and uh, the uh, link is there for, um, for any donations that you might want to make. Um, and I want to thank um, our team. Uh, uh, 
Aline Clicks, uh, NIU director. Uh, she is a director of web media and e-learning, and her staff works with us. Uh, so Raz Abdul Sarani and uh, Becky Griffith um, have been uh, the, the persons that helped us tonight. So we really thank them for assisting us with the Zoom platform this evening. And uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we would love uh, to have you back again. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.